So in this talk, um, I draw on research I've conducted on the related topics of composting, soil, dung hills, and worms in an attempt to synthesize my current thinking on early modern ways of imagining, describing, and promoting soil health. The early modern period informs our own understanding in ways that often go unacknowledged. In turn, our current crisis of soil health might inform the questions we ask, intensify their urgency, and render explicit the investments we bring to our study of the early modern. Although I've always been committed to historical inquiry, as my emphasis on a dialogue between past and present suggests, I'm equally interested in using, promoting, and interrogating the tools of literary analysis both to understand the past and to escape or at least loosen its fetters when possible. In this talk, I join with others who seek to trace the material roots of metaphor. What might we learn about the frequent early modern references to dung hills, for instance, if we investigate the composition and placement of actual early modern dung hills? But even as I seek to tether figuration to its origins in material practices, I also explore figuration's material consequences. That is, how we imagine and describe something shapes how we experience it and how we act in relation to it. Figures are agents. As such, they encourage some courses of action while discouraging others. Today, I'll discuss four figurations linked to soil health in early modern England and colonial America. The mouth, the dunghill or muck heap, the plow, and the community network, exploring how each figure informs soil amendment practices and opens up a distinct relationship between soil amendment then and now. Obviously, these figures are subtly different in that I'm addressing two ways of describing soil itself, as hungry or as a network, as well as two instruments for managing or mastering soil, the compost heap and the plow. But I hope that I can convince you that it's useful to think about these four in relation to one another. These four figurations will prove to be four models of how past and present might interact. Two are productive, one is an impediment, and one is largely outside the realm of the imaginable for early modern people. So first, let's talk about the mouth. For farmers and gardeners, the process of soil amendment begins in the imagination. A few years ago, I attended a workshop for young farmers held at the Agriculture Sustainability Institute near my campus. I confess that I felt a bit self-conscious as the one English professor amidst a group of farmers and soil scientists. The goal of the event was to encourage busy farmers to think differently about their soil and so to change their practices. But one participant said, well, of course I was an English professor. As she said, every person she knew in alternative agriculture chose that path because they had had their imagination captured. One of the things that can capture an imagination is vivid writing. Many of the visionaries of alternative agriculture are lyrical, forceful writers. But the potential for capturing imaginations can extend much farther back in time across a wide swath of genres, smudging the boundary between supposedly practical writings and poetics, a boundary that not, did not really pertain for early modern writers who offered practical advice in verse and evoked the particulars of farming practice in plays and sonnets. Let's start with an especially fertile figuration. While 16th century writers often described infertile soil as old or worn out, they found an alternative in Roman writers on agriculture. What if soil was not old, but hungry? What if the depletion of soil was not permanent, as the aging process is, but reversible? Approaching soil in this way would render it a renewable resource. As was often the case with the Renaissance of classical learning, this discovery would have offered a distinctly new way of thinking for some, but for others an affirmation or authorization of what they already sort of knew by experience. In his first century treatise De Re Rustica, Columella repeatedly calls soil hungry, starved, or fasting, often using the adjective jejuna. To quote an 18th century translation, it is not because of weariness, as very many have believed, nor because of old age, but manifestly because of our own lack of energy that our cultivated lands yield us a less generous return. For we may reap greater harvests if the earth is quickened again by frequent, timely, and moderate manuring. <clears throat> 
Note here that Cagliamella links the soil's hunger to human laziness and recommends industrious correction of this deficit. That emphasis on human intervention, as we will see, brings its own problems. The reference to quickening in this translation suggests that manuring impregnates the earth as well as feeding it. But the Latin verb is refovio, warm up, revive, or refresh. Soil that has been depleted needs to be restored with compost as a form of abalum, food, nourishment, or sustenance. Cagliamella ultimately advises the gardener to feed to the full the hungry fasting ground and to present as food to weary fallow ground what e'er the privy vomit from its dirty sinks. Descriptions of what the soil might be fed depict the earth as an indiscriminate, voracious, and grateful eater. Imagining soil as hungry inspires human effort, anthropomorphizing soil, and inviting a caregiving relation to it. It also adds peak and appetite to the sometimes insipid conceptualization of mother, of earth as a mother. This earth demands feeding rather than offering uncritical limitless nurture. And in the end, it will eat us too. The urgency of foraging food for the hungry earth brings us to our next figuration, the dunghill, or to use more recent terms, the uh, compost heap, okay, no, the compost heap um, or assemblage. All of these terms draw our attention to a process of collection and assembly, to the agents affecting that process and to its outcome, the thing that results. But we should not think of this in terms of a trajectory from agent to object. Instead, the term assemblage in recent critical usage insists on continuously unfolding and intertwining agencies. Jane Bennett refers to an agentic assemblage with violent infectivity as a force to be reckoned with, even if it is not purposive in any strong sense, that is adapted to a purpose or end or performed with conscious purpose or intention. In Karen Barad's terms, we might think about compost as less an assemblage of agents than an entangled state of agencies, agencies that emerge through their intra-action. For Barad, matter is substance in its intra-active becoming, not a thing but a doing, a congealing of agency. While early moderns didn't use the word assemblage, which seems to have entered into use in the 18th century, theirs was a culture of assemblage. They composed garments, dishes, texts, and even selves or identities through gathering and combining, and then sometimes assigned the resulting assemblage a kind of agency, or at least efficacy. I'd like to consider the muck heap or dunghill as such an assemblage. Joan Thirsk argues that Columella's Bere Rustica inspired a new vogue in constructing dunghills and compost heaps in 17th century England. Cagliamella argues that even where one cannot keep cattle or birds and thus might miss out on the benefit of their excrement, the industrious husbandman may amass and put together any kind of leaves and collections of any other things out of thickets and highways and mix them thoroughly with the dirt and sweepings of the courtyard. He may sink a pit for laying up dung in and gather into it in one heap, ashes and dirt of the kennels, sinks and common sewers, straw and stubble, and the other things that are swept out of the house. As this passage makes clear, dung is not only excrement, it's any kind of organic matter that can enrich soil, particularly in its composted form. That's why so many of the verbs in Columella's passage focus on human agency. A mass, mix, put together, cut down, lay up, gather into, or sweep out. Early modern composting began with what might at first appear to be the indiscriminate collection of materials. Most agricultural writers love lists. Gervais Markham, for instance, considers not only rotting vegetable matter, but also animal hair, entrails and offal, malt dust and other excrements of the malt, soap suds, what swept or shoveled up from house and yard, highways, back lanes and other such places, rotten fish and even human and animal blood urine and feces. The ongoing wide ranging and open-minded process of collecting and contributing that Markham describes is inventive, but not indiscriminate. Many other writers list possibilities for soil amendment with equal relish, adding hooves, wool scraps and rags, ash, soot, 
spent grains from brewing and wine leaves, among other things. In the soil amendment economy, there's little waste because even what seems useless can wonderfully enrich and fatten all manner of barren grounds. Adolphus Speed concludes his advice with the encouragement to throw in whatsoever you shall think in your own judgment to be helpful and advantageous thereunto. Through the judicious use of what might be considered waste, one can defy the tyranny of location. As one of Markham's titles promises, through enrichment, all sorts of barren and sterile grounds in our kingdom can prove to be as fruitful as the best grounds whatsoever. One achieves this by gathering and spreading. Proverbial wisdom described muck as like money. Riches are like muck, which stink in a heap, but spread abroad, make the earth fruitful. The heap might stink, but it usually preceded and facilitated the spread. Most early modern writers advocated carefully constructing a dunhill or muck heap, that is a place or even a structure where one might gather and ripen the organic materials that would become dung or compost. While composting instructions today tend to focus on turning and temperature, early modern writers instead emphasize positioning and protecting the pile or piles. The widely translated Maison Rustique advises at least two piles, one to keep as it rots and ripens and one to spread. Calumella suggests a covered pit and many early modern writers do too. Sir Hugh Platt anticipates that the farmers of our land will complain that it is too costly to build barns or other coverts for dunghills. Yet he advises his readers that they should make a little square receptacle of brick at the bottom of a hill to serve as a pit or cistern. The margin also calls this a covert for a muck heap. Platt expresses contempt for those who don't have the sense to cover their dunghills. All these simple sots which leave their muck heaps abroad and subject to the weather, show themselves to be but mean husbandmen and that they never tasted of any true natural philosophy. In case the reader is any, in any doubt, the margin reiterates, muck heaps ought to be covered. The husbandman worthy of the name will go to the expense and trouble of building a structure to contain and protect his muck. I would love to show a picture of this muck barn or covert, but I've yet to identify one clearly. In early modern texts, the pile is both everywhere and nowhere. It was both frequently recommended and almost as often invoked figuratively. Search early English books online for dung or muck, heap or hill, and you will get numerous hits almost equally divided between practical farming and gardening advice on the one hand and figural usage in theological treatises or insults and jests on the other. Practical descriptions are largely positive. Figural ones are at first sight negative, as the dunghill stands for the degradation and decay of mortal life, for what hitting the bottom looks like. Perhaps this is why searches for illustrations of dunghills largely yield depictions of Job on the dunghill. The dunghill sums up the low status from which one might be raised up or into which one might be cast. For my purposes, most such illustrations are more Job than dunghill, leaving open the question of what a dunghill should look like. I'm interested in this dunghill, for instance, which looks like straw. For all its cultural centrality, the dunghill is not visible in the many detailed illustrations of and plans for farms and gardens in English agriculture books. At least I'm not sure I see it in otherwise detailed uh, illustrations, such as this one from, from Moralidge, maybe here, um, uh, or these title pages from Blagrave. I mean, lots of detail, but no clear place where I would say, ah, that's dunghill construction. Um, these tools for the gardener from John Evelyn's manuscript Elysium Britannica also do not seem to include muck barns, although we have a central role for the wheelbarrow with which Dahlia began our conference today or yesterday actually. The terms hill, heap, and pile all suggest that contributions to the compost assemblage need not be organized. Once a site is chosen and a receptacle constructed, surely the next step is simply tossing the ingredients inside. But this process was more systematic and orderly than one might expect. In the translated passage from Columella, we saw the phrase, a pit 
for laying up dung in. Versions of the verb to lay appear in many English accounts of dunghill construction, suggesting depositing, packing down, and smoothing out. Laying indicates both saving, as in laying by or laying up, and structuring in terms of creating layers. It does not resemble composting as mixing or turning. Instead, it requires time and decay to break the layers down. Sir Hugh Platt uses the noun lay in the sense associated with masonry, a layer or stratum, when he advises readers on dunghill construction. Make first a lay of dung of a foot in thickness, and then a lay of earth upon the same, and then another lay of dung upon that earth, and so proceeding in the manner of stratum super stratum, till your muck heap be as large and high as you would have it. Drawing attention to, to the ways the muck heap is a composition built up layer by layer, Platt also uses lay as a verb to describe designing and planting a garden, as we might describe laying out a garden. Lay might even stand in for plant. Lay is still commonly used as a verb to mean putting down or putting to rest, as in laying dust or laying a ghost. This notion of putting to rest connects to the verb's particular or agricultural meanings. Markham, who frequently uses lay as a verb, advises the English husbandman to lay fallow that field and fallow the field he will lay to rest the year following. Sylvester's translation of Dubardus's Divine Weeks and Works explains God rest on the seventh day and the importance of honoring the Sabbath through bodily rest by analogy to this agricultural practice. A field left lay for some few years will yield the richer crop when it again is tilled. The action of laying the field fallow, leaving it lay, or laying it to rest, turned it into a lay, a noun often spelled L-E-Y, that is a field or arable strip left to rest unplanted for a while. As John Evelyn describes this, worn out and exhausted lay fields can by coverture, shade, rest and forbearance for a season, enjoy their Sabbaths. Exodus 23, verses 10 to 11, enjoined the lay field sabbatical. And six years thou shalt sow thy land and shalt gather in the fruits thereof. But the seventh year thou shalt let it rest and lie still that the poor of thy people may eat and what they leave the beasts of the field shall eat. In like manner thou shalt deal with thy vineyard and with thy olive yard. The practice was well established by the 17th century when these lays or temporary pastures might be left as long as 12 years between planting. Soil as assemblage is a matter of gathering, layering, and waiting. The lay is both the spatial layer and the temporal pause. Both my first two figurations, the hungry mouth and the dunghill, that is the assemblage of ripening amendments it will devour, promote the practices that are now sometimes called regenerative or conservation agriculture or agroecology. I'm just gonna give you a couple of infographics that try to capture the principles behind this approach. I just wanna point out in this one, no-till systems. Um, and in this one, the, the talk to the hand uh, to the um, tiller. So um, even these simplifications emphasize what one shouldn't do as much as what one should. Soil conservation demands that farmers plant a broad array of crops and include among them plants that will enrich the soil. Cover crops are often called green manure because they're planted to protect the soil and then to fertilize it. While the standard practice in the last century has been to plow cover crops back into the soil, proponents of con conservation or regenerative agriculture often advocate simply letting crops or their residue decay on the ground surface. Planted as food for the soil rather than for other consumers, green manure is a closed circle by which crops emerge from and return to the earth without ever leaving it. But to sustain green manure at the level depleted soils require, farmers need markets for the crops their soil wants to eat. Those crops include deep-rooted vegetables like radishes and turnips and soil building legumes like lentils. That means consumers need to eat them too. That is, the circle needs to expand to include humans. As a consequence, chefs and farmers are working to build appetites for these soil enhancing crops and to find innovative ways of using them. In his book, The Third Plate, Field Notes on the Future of Food, the chef Dan Barber asserts that we need to cook with and for the whole farm 
and eat the diversity of polyculture, particularly those crops that farmers need to grow to aerate and enrich their soils, thereby feeding the soil that feeds us. As Liz Carlisle puts it in Lentil Underground, ask not what your soil can do for you, but what you can do for your soil. This twist on John F. Kennedy's famous phrasing in his inaugural address invites consumers to think of eating as a kind of civil duty, even a sacrifice. By the way, I'm hoping you can see graphic designers struggle in these covers to depict soil in a visually interesting way and to link humans and soil. We can see that too in these hard and paperback covers of the book, What Your Food Ate, which again centers the soil as a hungry eater and links human and soil diets. The fork can certainly be an instrument of environmental and social change, but freighting food choices with ethical responsibility does not invariably compel changed conduct. Recent research into the relationship between healthy soil and a healthy human microbiome casts eating green manures is as less selfless, less a form of sacrifice or self-abasement. We aren't serving or sacrificing for the soil as much as promoting our own health, these uh, approaches suggest, by recognizing in a medical rather than theological conduct, context that we are of the soil. From dust we come and to dust we will return. We have just seen that figuring the soil as hungry helped motivate soil amendment before chemical fertilizers and is being revived to promote soil amendment as an alternative to them. Proposals to create markets for green manure add an additional twist to this figuration, linking consumers and soil as fellow eaters. While it's not always easy to convince people to buy and eat green manures, in part because uh, of that term perhaps, imagining the soil as hungry is useful to regenerative agriculture and even opens the possibility of understanding our bodies and the soil as interdependent systems. Those infographics I flash in front of you about regenerative agriculture suggest that one of the impediments to it is the early modern symbol of good husbandry, the plow. Although early moderns imagined soil as hungry, prompting the collection of waste to feed it, as I've been emphasizing, they also understood soil to require not just nurture, but domination. Not unlike other social subordinates, the main instrument of soil domination was the plow. Let's go back to these uh, Walter Blythe images, which we already saw in another uh, talk. Um, the plow was so well established a part of farming equipment for early modern people that it came to sum up the whole agricultural enterprise. The first settlers in Virginia in the early 17th century found it almost impossible to farm without draft animals, since that meant they had to pull their plows themselves. The plow secured hierarchies and marked distinctions. The plow depended on human dominion over the animals who pulled it but it also depended on differences between masters and workers. Francis Bacon advises rulers in his essay of the true greatness of kingdoms and estates to keep the plow in the hands of the owners and not mere hirelings. If the plow distinguished humans from animals and owners from underlings, it also distinguished male workers from female, since women agricultural workers used hoes instead. And as a consequence of this, in turn, European farmers from indigenous ones. Um, and I call us back to Patrick Bottinger's paper about this. European settler colonists saw people working uh, land, women working land with hoes and thought, well, those are not stakeholders. Those are not farmers. Andrew McRae argues that the plow was upheld throughout the early modern period as a central symbol of agricultural activity and rural life, serving as both an emblem of traditional structures of rural society in a stream of complaint decrying the effects of depopulating enclosure and as a symbol of the expansive energies of a farmer improving his land, in part by means of those very enclosures. The plow was, as McCray points out, simultaneously tool and trope, as both it represented and ensured mastery. Because of all of these associations, the plow, when used as a trope, carried the potential for violence. 
The analogy between plowing and intercourse is familiar, extending from Agri Agrippa's description of Caesar and Cleopatra in Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. He plowed her and she cropped to Dryden's famous put down of the childless Mary of Medina as a soil ungrateful to the tiller's care, to the continued use of plow as a verb for male penetration. The analogy between plowing and intercourse depends not just on associations between penis and plow, vagina and furrow, but also on the fact that plowing was predominantly men's work. Even Jane Sharp's guide for midwives claims that man in the act of procreation is the agent and tiller and sower of the ground. Woman is the patient or ground to be tilled. Using agriculture to figure sex and reproduction worked because as Mary Fassell writes, while the exact process by which a seed became a plant was mysterious, plowing and sowing seed were familiar to almost every man and woman in early modern England, a profoundly rural society in this period. This familiarity both naturalized plowing and imported its association with dominion and force into understandings of sexual intercourse. It was precisely because the plow was associated with masculinity, landowning, and mastery that it could figure both reproduction and rape. We find acknowledgments of the plow's violence in surprising places. Many influential early modern accounts of a golden age place paradise before the plow. And we've now heard a number of approaches to this at the conference. In George Sandus's translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses, for example, in the golden age, the yet free earth did of her own accord, untorn with plows, all sorts of fruit afford. Sandus's Ovid calls this fruit unenforced food, which the earth unmanured bears. Here is throughout 16th and 17th century texts, manuring not only means adding manure, but also any form of cultivating, tilling, or fertilizing. In the golden age, it is not necessary. The plow then ushers in or follows from a kind of irreversible fall. Land that has not been plowed or manured remains paradisal and paradoxically ripe for exploitation. It's a blank slate, whereas plowed land has been inscribed as well as possessed and compromised. Our symposium's title, Fertile Furrows, considers the plow's weight. We trace the marks the plow as a kind of pen leaves behind. The illustration from Ovid's Metamorphoses on the conference website, which Ivana also, also discussed, showcases the plow and the spade. And I want to emphasize here that the associations around them um, were strikingly negative. In the famous passage in which Sir Walter Raleigh describes Guyana as a country that hath yet her maidenhead, this is the famous phrase, um, he also elaborates that it has never been sacked, turned, nor wrought. The face of the earth hath not been torn, nor the virtue and salt of the soil spent by minorants. While Raleigh's description of the land as virgin, ripe for declaration, has been much discussed, I want to emphasize how Raleigh links rape and tillage, denigrating tillage as turning, tearing, and spending the soil. To till is to rape, to spoil, to fall from golden age to iron. It is destructive more than productive. This is the plow some proponents of regenerative agriculture want to ditch. The plow is invader, penetrator, and destroyer. As Raleigh's words show, the plow could already be seen this way in the early modern period in part because intercourse and rape, mastery and violence were so closely intertwined conceptually and in social practice. England will till Guiana, but it wants to be the first to do so. As part of his agenda to promote soil amendment, Sir Hugh Platt invites sympathy for a feminized earth. For what eye doth not pity to see the great weakness and decay of our ancient and common mother, the earth, which now is grown so aged and stricken in years, and so wounded at the heart with the plowman's bowed that she begins to faint under the husbandman's hand and groans at the decay of her natural balsamum, that is her natural capacity for self-healing and rejuvenation. For Raleigh, the untilled earth is an invitation to plunder the virgin land. For Platt, the over-tilled earth provokes attempts to assist the decayed mother. For both, the earth is feminized and tillage is an assault. <laughs>
Although Raleigh describes manurance ascending the soil, the redress for this destructive tillage was also called manurance. Whereas the plot is the engine of plunder as it tears and turns, manurance becomes a word for care in early modern England. One finds it in treatises on education, the cultivation and manurance of the mind, and on land law. law. To hold lands in manurance is to occupy and claim them. And this goes back to the idea of um, what can and can't be seen by settler colonists. As we've already seen in Raleigh's usage, manurance is both a consequence of and a solution to plowing. Plowing depletes and dries out soil. So if you plow, you have to manure, which means broadly amend or fertilize the soil. Thus, if the plow was an improvement that initiated one early agricultural revolution, soil amendment was an improvement that was then required to counter its negative consequences. It's hard to grasp this double meaning of manurance as the problem and the solution in the Oxford English Dictionary definition of the term. But the both and is crucial for understanding agricultural writings. Our attachment to the plow suggests that we rely on both labor and aggressive intervention to assert mastery over soil. We can understand that reliance and the impediment it poses to ditching the plow by considering the meanings the 17th century assigned to plows and tillage. I want to emphasize that these meanings are generative in the literal sense that they were often used to describe human sexuality and reproduction, and in the more general sense that they were powerful engines of cultural production. The many meanings assigned to the plow help explain why it might be so hard to let it go. This is then a figuration whose robust history impedes our attempts to change our practices. We carry the weight of the plow as a writer of meaning as an engine of industry with us, and that history can be hard to let go. On the other hand, if paradisal land does not need manurance, plowing and tillage, then perhaps it's that part of early modern thinking about agriculture that we might reclaim to help us think about why we can and should forego the plow and leave soil untilled and unthorn. So my, this is my last figuration, the community network. Earth felt the wound, John Milton writes, to capture the impact of the fall. I've also quoted Hugh Platt's mournful description of the earth as wounded. Clearly, early modern people could imagine a sentient and sensitive planet, soil that cries out for nurture and groans at the injury of tillage. Yet early modern writers seem to have imagined this anthropomorphized earth as a singular being, often feminized as nature or mother earth, more than a community or network. In contrast, scientists now describe soil as a mycorrhizal network composed of mycelium, tiny threads of a greater fungal organism that wrap around or penetrate tree roots and connect individual plants together to transfer water, nitrogen, carbon, and other material minerals. The more we understand soil as a community or network, the more we understand that we should not disturb it, leaving it unmolested to forge its relationships. Thus, ditching the plow and recognizing or honoring the network go hand in hand. It's not surprising that an understanding so recent and still somewhat contested would not be available in the early modern period. But were there any ways in which soil was linked to community? As we've seen, dung hills could be communal as well as individual, foraging for possible amendments, getting them from tradesmen and city dwellers, for instance, might have involved what we would now call networking. But if gathering materials for the muck heap or dung hill might be a collaborative process, the heap or hill itself was usually described as an it rather than a they. Its dynamism was that of decay. Promoting plant life, it was not usually understood as itself alive. In many ways, and yet it had certain forms of dynamism, of course, in many ways, the composting that Calumella and 17th century writers such as Markham describe seems recognizable to us. It depends on wide ranging collection, a dedicated spot or pit, careful management of moisture and heat, and patient waiting. Early modern writers understand that the compost pit performs the function of an animal's digestion, breaking down components and preventing the germination of seeds, for example. But they do not understand the role of microbial activity or of worms. Today, earthworms are the heroes of the compost pile. Com composters promote worms beneficent and collective industry through worm farms and vermiculture. But the idea that worms are good for soil is relatively recent. 
Late in his life, Charles Darwin wrote one last book, Formation of Vegetable Molds to the Actions of Worms with Observations on Their Habits. That was in 1881. Depicting worms' digestion as productive, Darwin insisted that all the vegetable mold over the whole country has passed many times through and will again pass many times through the intestinal canal of worms. Darwin's worms were workers, plowmen, and historical agents. It may be doubted whether there are many other animals which have played so important a part in the history of the world as have these lowly organized creatures, he wrote. While Darwin was wrong about some aspects of soil life, he was right about the crucial role of worms. But it took soil science a while to catch up with him. Writing in 1947, Albert Howard, sometimes called the father of compost, advised that nature has her own labor force, ants, termites, and above all, earthworms. These carry the humus down to the required deeper levels where the thrusting roots can have access to it. Howard celebrates the lowly earthworm as the great conditioner of the food materials for healthy crops. Earthworms are actively at work, he writes, and their work is a productive form of consumption. Actually, he says, the earthworm eats of the humus and of the soil and passes them through its body, leaving behind the casts, which are really enriched earth, perfectly conditioned for the use of plants. More recently, geologist David Montgomery in his history of soil erosion and his proposals for soil regeneration emphasizes the agency of worms. Worms are like tiny livestock eating organic matter and fertilizing a farmer's field. We need them there well-fed and happy. Plowing is like setting off a bound in their living room, first destroying their homes and then when the bare soil at the surface has turned into a water-resistant crust, drying up their water well. Montgomery makes it clear here that one must abandon the plow to save the worms. Yet the plow's ability to disrupt and destroy worm habitat and activity is one of the things that endeared it to early modern farmers and writers because they sought to eliminate rather than promote earthworms. Early modern writers recognized the earthworm as an effective agent, but they insisted its work was destructive. Although putrefaction had long been understood as generative, worms were not seen as agents in that spontaneous generation. Their subterranean industry, it was thought, consumed and contaminated, but did not produce. They were the farmer's adversaries rather than allies, underminers of agriculture rather than creators of its very foundation. Thomas Moffat, for example, understands the earthworm. I wanted you to see the Latin cover with the worm there. <laughs> understands the earthworm as a consumer rather than producer of soil. They breed of the slime of the earth, taking their first being from putrefaction and of the fat moisture of the same earth, they're again fed and nourished and into earth at last are resolved. They might then be considered analogs of the human, bread of dirt and resolving back into it. But while Moffat is quick to find uses for earthworms as fish bait and ingredients in medicines, his assessment is largely negative. Since worms appear to be full of earth, Moffat opines that they eat it rather than that they excrete it. Observing that earthworms are not to be found in all soils alike, as in barren, sandy, stony, hard, and bare grounds, but only in fat, gravelly, moist, clammy, and fertile, he thinks they're drawn to the fertile rather than that they help produce it. As a consequence, early modern recipes for compost do not advocate promoting earthworms. Instead, agriculture and gardening manuals offer suggestions on how to eliminate them as pests. Leonard Maskell in The Countryman's Recreation advises that when one is planting fruit trees, if one sees uh, worms, then one should kill them. Otherwise, they will hurt greatly the roots of the trees. Markham's Farewell to Husbandry warns that worms, being as it were the main citizens within the earth, are so innumerable that the loss which is bred by them is infinite. They are a secret, hurtful vermin, which is so innumerable and lies so much concealed. 17th century writers then had no problem imagining the small agencies of earthworms. They could even see them as citizens of the earth, incalculably effective, but not to the good. However invested in soil amendment early moderates were then, their quest to improve their soils was hampered by what they not only did not yet know, but by the ways that their cultural associations with the earthworm impeded their knowledge and their observation 
making it impossible to imagine the lowly and dirty worm as a central agent in creating fertile soils. Now, even the work of worms as parasites is being rethought. Studies that link soil health to the health of the human biome suggest the work worms do for the soil and the human gut. Daphne Miller, for instance, argues that geohelminths, worms that live as happily in the soil as they do in the human or animal gastrointestinal tract, tend to act like many other farm microbes, releasing protective substances and stimulating a counter-regulatory anti-inflammatory response. In other words, she writes, the worm and host are involved in a long conversation and are working for mutual benefit since the worm is able to live indefinitely within the human intestine and the host gets a boost in immunity. Like other recent popular writings on the immune system and the human microbiome, this passage aspires to make us a little less invested in cleanliness, a little more open to dirt. I'm giving you two versions of Miller's cover here to again emphasize designer's ingenuity in depicting tilth and linking humans and plants. And also the way that this, what this brings out among other things is a very early modern notion of sympathy, right? The vegetables in the shape of a heart or the carrot person. Miller's advice resembles that of regenerative gardeners that we worry less about raking up all the leaves and pulling out all the weeds. A little mud, a little mess can be fecund. I'm interested in how often innovations are depicted in the early modern period and today as both new and old. The benign neglect of gardening is like that in that it both depends on new science and recognize the wis recognizes the wisdom of ancient, particularly indigenous knowledges. This approach also works against the imagery of battle, another figural node with material consequence, which often shapes our relation to disease and disorder in our bodies, as well as our gardens. We do battle on the farm or in the garden against vermin and against the invasive, non-native. But what if we laid down our arms? A regenerative approach on the farms from which we get our food and in our own gardens also invites resistance to the ubiquitous gardener's timetables and to-do lists, which have structured the address to farmers and gardeners from early modern almanacs like Evelyn's here, telling us what to do every month of the year, um, to recurring features in recent magazines like Sunset and Fine Gardening. Here's what you should do right now. While it can be hard to resist scrubbing every bit of dirt off that organic carrot or equating hard work and tidiness with horticultural virtue, these daily choices can help us reflect on how a history of thinking and describing of figurations shapes our imaginations and our actions. Today, I've tried to emphasize both fertile figurations and those that can inhibit or limit our thinking. I want to conclude with this poster created for farmers at UC Davis, linking both the imagery of feeding the soil, which we traced back to antiquity and its renaissance in the early modern period, and the relatively new insight that soil is not an it, but a they. Thank you. Thank you, Francis, uh, for a, a really wonderful talk that opened up the figurative possibilities of the early modern period and showed a lot of the unexpected connections with present gardening and soil and ecological concerns. Um, I, we have 15 minutes for discussion. So if you have questions, please send them to me or feel free to raise your hand. I'll start with uh, just a, an attempt to bring together some of the strands that you've had, that, you, that you've that um, you opened up here. You, really digging into the metaphors, um, I'm struck of course by what you're presenting as metaphors connected to soil fertilization transformation and their clear opposition to something that, that comes later and is given a big emphasis in intellectual history, which is mechanical metaphors. So you've got, you've mentioned Bacon and obviously Evelyn is a contemporary of the Royal Society, but is not using the mechanical metaphors of many of his contemporaries. And instead, you've got this other way of thinking about the earth and our relations to them. So I, I, and of course, the plow is often associated with the same kind of domination that mechanical metaphors brought with it. So the opposition to the plow, um, as one of the, the approaches here, I think, highlights what you're you're not talking about and what you're focusing on instead. So I just want to invite you to think uh, uh, or to, to say a little more about what these metaphors and figures that you're exploring might add up to as a kind of alternative set of cosmological metaphors. 
how do, what what kind of world are we talking about here? Is there are, are there any possibilities of summarizing it? And and I and I'd like to just suggest one thing that it doesn't seem like you're talking about, which is the chain of being, which is one kind of metaphorics of of cosmology. Although you're a Shakespearean scholar, you certainly see the, and see that at work in in this period elsewhere. It doesn't seem to be something that that's relevant, particularly except as a negative figure. Of, of domination and hierarchy that that uh, that that gardeners look at. So where where's the chain of be, being here? Is it really something that you can just leave aside? Another field of metaphors uh, at the cosmological level that you seem to be hinting at with sympathy, your reference to sympathy, and maybe present here is alchemy. So I wonder if you've thought at all about how alchemy informs the metaphorics of the soil in this period, with its cyclical nature, with its emphasis on um, processes which produce value, and and of course the tr the digestion and transformation of matter from one form to another, and also the implication that matter often uh, has a, has a living dimension to it. So, in what ways is this not the chain of being, and in what ways is this alchemy? If the, if those are thoughts, you can you can um, expand on it. But above all, thank you for a fascinating talk. Well, thank you for an incredible response. There's so much going on here. Um, so first, when you were talking about how I'm not discussing the uh, mechanical, um, although sort of by thinking about this one engine, uh, the, the tool, um, you made me think about Daniel Botkin and the way that he tries to just challenge how invested we are in various kinds of figure models of the cosmos and how they all have problems. So he always wants to say, okay, uh, nature is not a machine. It is not a human. It is not any of these things. So in some ways that's a, an occasion to think the more you look at all the different kinds of figural models there've been, the more it alerts you to be suspicious of those models. Um, uh, I think to go, to skip over chain of being for a minute and go to alchemy, Alchemy is absolutely relevant to how people think about soil in this period, um, especially in a very positive way in terms of its notion of um, miraculous transformation, that things can become other than they appear to be, that they have, um, that there, you never know what's in potential within something. So I think that is, um, a very, uh, it can be very productive for agriculture, these ways of thinking about um, activating potentials that are might not necessarily on the surface or not necessarily visual. Um, so I think, and even, you know, some of the discussions of earth, uh, of well-composed amended soil as almost mystical marriages. I mean, clearly that we're gendering the different components, et cetera, clearly that's indebted to um, alchemy. But, you know, another debt, I would say, I'm thinking of Catherine Eggert's wonderful book, Disknowledge, about alchemy in the early modern period, that um, alchemy is useful to think about here when we're thinking about what the impediments to knowledge are. And one of the things Eggert argues is that people sometimes invested in alchemy as a way not to know things they preferred not to know, but could, but that were available to them in the 17th century. It's, a, it's, a, it's very interesting. And there's a lot of places in agriculture now where thinking about willed disknowledge, a, a, a willful desire not to know, you know, talk to winemakers, you know, about whether they'll be making wine in five years in certain areas, you know, they would like not to think about that in some ways, and in other ways are now being totally pressed. You know, they could, they could avoid it a few years ago and now it's becoming impossible. But so I think alchemy is also useful in terms of its status as a knowledge system in the early modern period that both invited robust, imaginative, passionate engagement and was understood to be suspect and sometimes used as a shield against other kinds of knowledge. In terms of the um, chain of being, you know, one of the things that's interesting, I mean, you mentioned that I'm a Shakespearean, you know, we were on the one hand decades ago instructed, everyone knew this and, and believed it. But now, I mean, I think more and more we think there's no cultural moment when you can say everybody knows X or everybody knows Y. I think every teacher here knows there's moments when students say, what was the early modern attitude towards homosexuality, you name the topic. And I always say, well, what's the attitude in your family? 
right? What's the attitude? There's not, the idea that there's a kind of consensus is a, is a fantasy that people often have. So I think it never was as it was once argued to be in Shakespeare plays, the given that everyone agreed with. It was a, it was a useful way of thinking. And I think if we apply it to agriculture, it is a useful way of thinking um, in some ways, because for instance, it um, can promote, you know, what's fascinating about it, it's, it, in a way it's like talking about Christianity. It can promote husbandry and care for the earth and fellow creatures, and it can promote a kind of um, uh, exploitation and mastery. It can really run both ways because of where humans are in that chain. So I think it is totally relevant. I think it's something that comes up in um, many kinds of agricultural texts. And also, if you just play the game of not dividing texts by categories that make sense to us, and in some ways, data searches have made that easier to do, um, you start to see how theological texts and agricultural texts have an enormous amount in common in terms of their, um, their frames of reference, et cetera. So I think, um, I think that it's there, but it's also, it's being, it's uptake is fascinatingly different. So, you know, there are people who say it's just obscene to mine the earth. Um, that is clearly not what we should be doing, and in, including we shouldn't be going down. We shouldn't be digging down. That's um, that's a kind of um, derogation of our human place. At the same time, that various kinds of extraction ecologies are getting uh, up and running, and we're mining like mad. So, so I think it's. I'm always trying to find ways to, without muddying the situation too much say, well, it's both this and it's that. You can, if you look over here, you see it operating this way. And if you look over there, it's different. I hope that Thanks. responded to your- Very sentence. much, very directly. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Delia, please. Thank you. Thank you, Francis, for, uh, for such a wonderful talk. And I think you brought together a lot of the things that we've been discussing over these two days. Um, my question is um, kind of comes from an art historian perspective, um, and is what why do you think is such a why do you think that you cannot find uh, fertilizer represented or dung represented? Is it because it's hard to represent, or what do you think they prefer sometimes to resort to alleg um, allegories or? Right. I, it's a great, it, 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 that is the question for me. And in some ways it was thinking about it for this conference that made me really notice how hard the designers of these recent books are working to try to render vibrant the soil mm -hmm. that they're uh, defending. Um, so I think part of it is this phenomenon of something that's everywhere and nowhere, right? That it that the more people think, well, of course everybody has a dung hill, and of course every farm, and it's not beautiful. And maybe you stick it behind the outbuildings that you've put on the the illustration. So some of it is, I think, a sense of, well, that's not important. Everybody knows you have that. A sense that it's not beautiful. You know, Platt and other people are arguing you should have a little covert, but probably a lot of people didn't. They probably had pits or hills mm -hmm. that really show up that well. Um, but I think it's always interesting, both what's representable, you know, from, from different disciplinary perspectives, what's representable, what does it mean when we don't see something? Sometimes it means that it's, it's everywhere. It's not important enough to recognize. It's like, if it's not in the, in the index, that sometimes means that it's everywhere in the book and it's impossible to put in the index. Um, and some of it is a kind of challenge. And we've seen such beautiful images, such amazing images in this whole conference. And I think, um, and I see Anna's camera came on it, you know, and tapestry and it arguably is a, is a, a medium that is better equipped to give us that textural sense of earth. Mm -hmm. um, but we've seen some other, um, some other images as well. So I don't know, I kind of feel like I'm, I'm still looking, but I think it's all of these different, I think all of these things are in play. 
I don't see any other questions, and we're we're moving into our the moment of the final wrap up. So just to wrap up this phase, um, I, I just want to thank you again, Francis, for a really wonderful talk that tied together so many so many threads over the course of this really exciting conference. And thank you, thank you for your your your, your presentation, Robin.